So now we have another uh, dual presentation, and that's Trevor Jones uh, from Plant and Food Research and Chua Min Tan from Massey University, uh, where they're going to be, um, Trevor's going to start talking about giant willow aphids affecting the spring flowering and growth of willow trees, and then partway through he'll introduce uh, Chaw's presentation. So thanks very much, Trevor. As John mentioned, we've got two short presentations today. Um, so I'll give a presentation on the effect of giant willow aphids on uh, the growth and spring flowering of willow trees. And then I'll hand over to Joel Tun, uh, who's a PhD student at Massey University, and he'll look at the chemistry of uh, honeydew. We've been running a field trial, willow field trial at Massey University for the last two uh, growth seasons. And this is looking at the effect of the giant willow aphid on young willow trees. These are willow trees grown from cuttings. They're just uh, 20 centimetres long, about one to two centimetres in diameter, which is what is usually used in commercial nurseries, such as in regional councils. We've got 15 different willow clones in this trial, um, which is shown in the picture here. Um, this was taken earlier this year after nearly two seasons growth. There are a range of uh, tree and shrub willow clones. Um, some are trees for bees, selections for bees, uh, and some are commercial clones used for soil conservation by regional councils, farmers, uh, river managers. And you can see there's quite a range of uh, shapes and forms and um, sizes with these and colours with these um, clones. The trial's laid out in, in two uh, in paired rows. And so uh, one row, you've got um, aphids on the tree and the uh, adjacent row we have kept free of aphids, either by spraying with insecticide or um, actually uh, squashing the aphids. And within the rows, you've got uh, uh, plantings of each clone in blocks. In each of the rows that uh, are infested with aphids, we actually uh, inoculated the trees with aphids. And the reason for this is um, early in the season, in uh, December, January, when aphids first appear on the trees, they're quite patchy in their distribution, and so we wanted some good even um, infestation of the trees. So Chol um, had the uh, delicate task of uh, putting uh, ten, five or ten aphids on each tree. You can see he's doing it here with a, uh, a soft bristled brush um, and you'd think it'd be easy you know you put the aphids on the tree and they just tap into the sap and get going you know multiply quickly but uh, what he found is sometimes the aphids would just disappear and they're very large aphids and they're very mobile so they'll actually walk quite some distance and it would seem if they're, they're not happy where they're put they'll, they'll sometimes just wander off to another tree so um, <laughs> Uh, both seasons we actually had to do for some trees two inoculations to get some um, good infestation. Now the aphids appear either usually in December, January and then the numbers increase very rapidly through till about April and then decline in May, June when it's getting colder. Now this um, uh, figure here is showing the uh, aphid populations on the unsprayed trees in April when the uh, populations are at their peak. And you can see um, there's quite, quite some differences between the, uh, the willow clones or species as I've shown here. <clears throat> so the darker the, the bar, the more aphids there are on the tree, and the longer the bar, oops, um, then there's a higher percentage of trees with these aphids. So you can see Salix candida, a very good willow for bees, shrub willow, very susceptible to the aphids, a lot of aphids on this as is Salix feminalis. This is a willow that's used by basket willow growers and uh, for stabilising river banks. Um, Salix alba, um, white willow from Europe, also very susceptible. It's not widely grown, but it is grown a bit by beekeepers now. Um, but it is widely used in, um, in the hybrid with Matsudana, and so some of you may be familiar with Tangoya mutri, two very widely used um, willows for soil conservation. Um, quite susceptible, as is Matsudana, another soil conservation tree. Um, There's a new clone, Matsudana lasiandra. Um, Fragilis, crack willow, was also quite susceptible. And Shirinii um, kiyanagi, Japanese fodder willow, which is also um, quite widely used. There are a couple of clones here which were very resistant. Areocephala, it's good for bees, a shrub willow, and another shrub willow. Uh, it's come out of our breeding program at Plant and Food. It's uh, Lassiolepis crossed with Viminellis. 
Um, both of these, we had very few aphids on the trees. Survival was actually very good. Um, for most of the clones, we had 100% uh, survival, um, but there were a couple of, uh, or a few exceptions. Um, for Manellis, we saw uh, a reduction in survival to 80% with aphids and with uh, Salix candida, the most susceptible, the survival dropped down to 60% after two seasons. Um, uh, Area cephala, very resist resistant to the aphids, but not quite so resistant to drought stress. So we did have a little bit of um, mortality due to um, drought stress in the second season. Now we didn't see any reduction in height or diameter growth during that first growth season. Um, the trees and the uh, rows with the aphids and without um, had the same height and diameter growth. But what we saw in the second season in 2018 to 19 was quite a noticeable effect of the aphids on the trees uh, for some of the clones. So you could see here Salix candida, 90% reduction in height growth in the second season. Uh, Salix verminalis, 55%. Um, and for these commercial clones, Matsudana, Matsudana alba, uh, Tanguo Mutri, we had a 25 to 35% reduction in height growth in the second season. Um, crack willow, it's pretty tough, but um, uh, about a third of 33% reduction in height growth. Um, but we did um, have some resistant clones here, Eriocephala, Lassiolepis, Lassiolepis verminalis. There's either none or only a slight reduction in height growth with the aphid. So that was very encouraging. And here we've got a, a visual um, of the effect of the aphid on the height growth. So this is um, Salix verminalis, um, very susceptible to the aphid. The uh, trees on the left here, it's got probably a little hard to see, but they have blackened stems. Um, these had aphids on them. The trees here on the right no aphids, and you can see there's quite a dramatic difference in terms of the height and the diameter growth on these trees. So the aphids were having quite a substantial effect. Another thing we noticed was uh, when the one-year-old trees started flowering in spring. So for a couple of the clones, Salix candida and uh, the pussy willow ricardio, which some of you may know, um, we saw a one to two week um, delay in flowering. So this is Salix candida. The trees here on the right, no aphids, and you can see they're fully out in flower, great big catskins, great for bees. And the uh, trees on the left with aphids on um, the previous season, um, barely a catkin out. So we had, um, in this case, two week delay in flowering. And also for quite a number of clones, we actually saw the flowering season was extended with aphids on them. So up to four weeks longer for Salix verminalis. So what we're thinking is, during the first growth season, the aphids are not having an impact on the trees. Um, they're growing actively, but it's that second season, and we think that they're, they're tapping into the sap, taking sugars during that time when the trees are forming buds for the next season, when they're sending uh, sugars down to the roots um, for, for the next season, and it's that second season they can't get away as quickly, they struggle, and that the, the growth is delayed, and so we see that reduction in growth. We also see for some of them, such as in Salix candida, uh, a reduction in catkin size as well. So um, um, generally not a reduction in the number of catkins, but certainly a, a much smaller catkin. And just in summary, susceptible willows, um, survival and height growth reduced, spring flowering delayed and extended, and catkin size reduced in some clones. Whereas for resistant willows, no effect of the aphids on um, survival and flowering and at most just a, a slight reduction in height growth. Um, yeah, one thing I'll mention is we have a newsletter for the, uh, the project, um, um, and it's actually just been printed yesterday. Um, this is the SFF um, uh, Sustainable Farming Fund project um, on the giant willow aphids, so that's the uh, funded uh, Stephanie's work on the biocontrol and the work that Chola and I have been doing on willow health. So it's just a, a one page and we've got some on the table over there by the water coolers there so you'll find a, a, a pile of um, newsletters there you can um, pick up um, uh, either now or at uh, the end of the session. Um, and Stephanie's got some here in the front if you want to come up and um, talk to Stephanie or um, at the end. 
OK, and Stephanie's saying she'll drop some off the Trees for Bees um, table as well. So if you're passing by there, you can pick, um, pick one up there. Um, I guess, yeah, we could take the opportunity to uh, have questions on my presentation, if you'd like that. We we're going to um, do that at the end, but um, uh, if anyone's got some questions, um, just fire ahead. Uh, that's resistant to the, um, the willow aphid that's going to be suitable for erosion control. So a, a you know, large freestanding as opposed to the, the shrimp, which most of those ones that are done well in your trials seem to be. Okay, the question is whether we've got cultivars suitable for a soil erosion control that are resistant to the aphid. Um, there were two, two willows in that trial, uh, Aerocephala and uh, a new clone, um, Lassolepis, crossed with Firminellus. Uh, the Aerocephala is um, a bit of a scruffy um, basket willow clone that came from uh, America. Um, it's got a very long flowering season, so it's actually it's very good for bees. It doesn't have a lot of flowers, but it flowers for like two to three months. Um, but it's probably not very good for soil erosion, so it's, it's probably great for a, a quiet stream or um, uh, where, where you've got some room to put uh, uh, some shrub willows where it's not too dry, you know, a damp patch. But the um, Lassilepis fumnellus was actually bred for soil erosion. It's um, actually got a very good drought tolerance. It's got better leaves from the Lassilepis and a very long growing season. The Lassilepis is a shrub willow that comes from California. Um, and we have um, distributed that um, the last two, three years to regional council nurseries um, uh, for them to grow for um, soil erosion uh, protection. So that will be available um, from quite a few of the nurseries. Um, probably the first stakes would have come out last year or this season. If any of you wanting to get some uh, cutting material that we can actually uh, plant and food supply with a, a small number of cuttings, there's just a, a small charge just to cover costs. So, if you wanted to get uh, a few cuttings to, to try out, um, grow um, as rooted trees to plant out, um, then just um, contact us at Plant and Food. Um, that shrub willow um, is a multi-stem willow, so it'll have um, probably three, four, five stems, um, and it grows to eventually about 10 metres. It's um, very drought tolerant um, and very quick growing. Generally, the shrub willows are grown as stakes. You could potentially um, grow them as poles if you wanted to um, take time to grow them to a, a larger size. Um, um, but generally, more likely to be one and a half, two meter, uh, one and a half or a meter stake. But yeah, potentially you could. They they do grow to quite a large diameter. Yep. Oh, in your in your location there, right? And that's so. Uh, yes, um, but this we saw very few aphids on them. Um, the stems weren't at all blackened, as you saw with um, some of the other willows. Um, and um, yeah, very good drought tolerance. The the rabbits don't like them. Um, so yeah, potentially quite useful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to my supervisor, Viva, Marsha, Andrea, and Marsha University, Plant and Food Research, New Zealand Poplars and Willow Research Track. Today I will be talking about host mediated difference in quality and chemical compositions of honeydew of the giant willow aphid. As we all know, the giant willow aphid is the one of the largest aphid species that feed on the stems of the willow and the poplar. It damaged the plant by sucking the plant sac, I mean the flow and sex, and release the copious amounts of honeydew. In terms of number, giant willow aphid release one to two millimeter juke per hour of honeydew. From the physiological perspective, giant willow aphid is the, uh, sorry, Honeydew of the giant willow aphid is the sugar-rich liquid consisting of the compositions of the fluent sacs 
that had not been assimilated by the insects and the waste product from the insect metabolism. Any juice of the giant willow if it can contain sugars, amino acids, lipids, and some sort of secondary metabolite derived right from the plants. It can be said that any juice of the giant willow if it contain equal composition, equal amount of glucose, sucrose, fructose, and the millicetone. We all know the problem, I mean the millicetone problem in the agriculture industry. The information about the clone that contribute to the minimal millicetone content is needed to solve the energy related problem in the agriculture industry. In order to do that, energy collection was then from March to May in 2018. At first, we, used, uh, we normally use the disposable aluminum fine cup, but energy collected, energy that fall inside the cup was robbed by the bees and the best bula wet. That's why we use the disposable plastic cup covered with the mesh to prevent the honeydew foraging by the bees and the webs. And the collected honeydews were stored in the minus 20 degree before analysis. Honeydew sugar analysis was then by using the HPLC with automated ingest, ingest sampler. And the calibration cut were made by using the, by plotting the big area of the A standard standard. I used the uh, full sugar. Uh, millicito, sucrose, glucose, and the fructose as a standard standards. In terms of quality, the honeydew produced from the giant willow aphid differ significantly, and the, the giant willow aphid that feed on the silent masudana cross with the ever produced the greatest amounts of honeydew followed by the masudana, shiniyan, and the rest. Statistically, to the sugar concentration of the honeydew, the positive vine, the giant willow, if it did not significantly different from one another, but the greater sugar concentration was observed in the honeydew collected from the from the silent lasciandra, and the the minimum amount of sugar concentration was observed in silate puparia. The millisito concentrations of the honeydew of the giant willow if it ranges from 40% to 60%, it very huge amount. And the greatest uh, millisito contents of the honeydew was observed in candida, and the lowest were found in puparia. Contrary to the millisito content, the sucrose contents of the honeydew was highest in the puparia and the lowest was observed in candida. Similar to the millisito contents, fructose contents of the honeydew was highest from the honeydew of the giant willow aphid that feed on the candida, and the lowest were observed in Shunii, Masudanus, and the Laziolepus honeydew. The glucose concentrations of the honeydew differ statistically significantly different, and then the highest amounts of glucose was observed in the silent richardi, followed by the candida and the Masudana cross with Lasciandra. The remaining 10 clones did not have different amounts of glucose concentration. To sum up, so the sugar concentrations of honeydew is similar for the willow clone, and millicito is the dominant sugar, containing 40 to 60% in the honeydew. Sucrose and the fructose are the other remaining uh, dominant sugar. And the, we cannot collect the honeydew from the resistant clone, like the Laziolepa cross with Vemenelis and the Iriosacla. That's all my presentation. Thanks.
Um, have you done any tests on poplars? No, no. We try to test the honeydew from the poplar, but we cannot get the sufficient amounts of giant willow if they feed on the poplar. That's why we couldn't collect the honeydew from the poplar.